Let's look to God as we come to his word this morning. <clears throat> Lord, you are so good. So many things that we were thinking of now that you heard, and we give you praise for all of those things. We thank you for all of your blessings, for the ways you're helping us go further in our relationship with you, for the hard things that cause us to trust you. Lord, we love you, and now we come to listen to your word and to hear um, what you have to say to us. Lord, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. Amen. Well, today we're in John 19. Um, last week we looked at standing in the truth and how, Je- how the Jewish leaders and Pilate were struggling with the truth of Jesus who was in their midst. The Jewish leaders, as you remember, wanted Jesus crucified. Um, Pilate, the Roman governor, wanted to set him free. And so the struggle continues in our text today. But let's remember what has happened. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was bound and arrested. He was brought to the chief priests and interrogated. At daybreak, he's brought to Pontius Pilate, who's the governor of Judea. And he's brought to his palace. And you may remember that the Jews didn't enter the palace because... It's almost Sabbath, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, and for them to enter into a Gentile's home would be uh, a way for them to defile themselves, so they stay out in the courtyard or in the porch patio area and um, speak to Pilate from there. Uh, We know it's a day of preparation, meaning it's a preparation for Passover, a preparation for the, the Sabbath. And so the Jews, which is so interesting, is they want Jesus crucified before the Sabbath begins. Isn't that great? Um, Because they want to, they can't crucify him on the Sabbath, so he needs to be crucified that day. Um, And they don't want to, to defile themselves or become unclean so that they can't celebrate the Sabbath and the Passover. So they've got to get this guy killed quickly. Very funny, isn't it? So Pilate initially wants them to judge Jesus themselves. It's your business, you take care of it. Um, But they can't execute anyone. And so right up front, they're saying, no, we can't execute him. So we we can't judge him ourselves. So Pilate goes back in to speak with Jesus, who is in Pilate's um, palace. And after questioning and having some interaction, he finds no basis for punishment. Now Luke tells us that at this point, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas was the governor who oversaw the the area of Galilee. Knowing Jesus was a Galilean, Pilate thought, well, this is the way out. I can send him to Herod and let Herod deal with it because he's a Galilean. So that's Herod's jurisdiction. Well, Luke tells us also that Herod finds no reason to uh, convict him of anything and sends him back to Pilate. So that didn't work. Um... Pilate then tries another um, plan. He, um, at around Passover, there's a amnesty program that the Romans would, um, would uh, um, enter into with the Jews. They would set free one of their prisoners. So Pilate's like, hey, we can set free Jesus as part of this amnesty at Passover. And so he tries that. But the Jews say, no, we don't want that. We'd rather have Barabbas, who is a known rebel. And that brings us to John chapter 19. So let's read, uh, let's read this text and hear how the story continues. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. 
When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So as we pick up chapter 19 of, of John, Pilate tries a different tack to satisfy the Jewish leaders. He has the soldiers flog Jesus. And it's just a sentence, but um, we need to understand that this was something quite serious because um, what they would do is strip him down and they would whip him with a, a, a whip that had a wood handle and rawhide thongs. And at the end of each thong, would be a piece of bone, a piece of metal, or um, a, a piece of glass. And so you can imagine what effect that would have on someone's back. And so they flogged Jesus with this rope, with this whip. And to add to the suffering, they mock him as a king. They put a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe, and they beat him again and again, it says. So then they bring him back, and Pilate presents this broken, bleeding figure to the Jews. Here is the man, he says. And you can imagine what he's trying to do is, is elicit some compassion. Say, see, he's already been punished. We've, he's already gone through enough. Let him go. But the political maneuvering continues. The Jews don't respond with compassion. They demand crucifixion. Pilate invites the Jews to crucify him themselves, knowing full well they don't have the authority to do that. And as the Roman governor, he finally summarizes what he feels. He finds no basis for any punishment, and he believes that Jesus is innocent. And even if the Jews don't recognize it, Pilate is recognizing that Jesus is the king of the Jews, which is interesting. But the Jews per persist, determined to get rid of Jesus. They claim that he must be put to death because of blasphemy. And um, what he's referring to is that he claimed to be the Son of God, which they knew was a, a word for the claiming to be God himself. And then the hypocrisy just piles up because the Jews know that's not getting them anywhere. So then they say, well, look, um, you can't let him go because he claims to be a king. And if you let a king go, you are no, no friend of Caesar's at all. Jesus is brought out again. Pilate sits in the judgment seat, offers him back as their king. And Pilate eventually caves in and hands Jesus over to the soldiers we know he carries his cross to Golgotha and is crucified and dies. In this Lenten season, it's important, as Katrina mentioned, for us to remember, to tell the story, to listen to the story that Jesus suffered so much abandonment and injustice and humiliation and mockery and beating and flogging and torture is what the crucifixion was all about. And it compels us to ask, why would he suffer and die in this manner, under so much injustice, so much abuse? And even more, since his suffering and death is the main event in his life, everything he did, everything he, he spoke about, 
was pointing to and leading to this event, his suffering and his death. What does this truth of Jesus mean for us in our story? That's the important thing, right? What, 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 is, what does this mean for us? What are we supposed to do with it? And this week and next, we will spend more time just looking at the suffering and the death and, and trying to understand and, and, and explore this together. But as Katrina asked, uh, encouraged us last week, we are to believe this truth, that Jesus suffered and died for you and for me. We know that because Jesus said that he was going to do that. John 1.12, John says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 3.16 is very well known, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. So believing that Jesus suffered and died for us is a very important response to this. He wasn't a victim. No one killed him. He was a servant who humbled himself and submitted himself to unjust suffering at the hands of sinful people. And so we believe he willingly suffered under this corrupt religious and political system to set us free from it. And in doing so, he revealed the truth that his kingdom was from above, that his father had sent him to rescue us. The truth that this king suffers and dies for his subjects, even those who fail him or want to kill him. It's a truth that this Lord joins us in our suffering. He identifies with us by entering into our suffering with us. He knows what it means to suffer. And the truth is that this God has a love for all people that is self-giving and limitless. That God's love is the kind of love that lays itself down for others. In John 10, 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. That is the love of God. A love that, that gives itself for the sake of of other people. Now, on this day, um, let me ask you a question. Do, you, do we believe Purdue will win the NCAA tournament? <laughs> Got to get a little smile in there. It's a little heavy, right? <laughs> um, maybe some of the players believe that. Maybe you believe that. But I would suggest that at this point, that it would be called a wish or a desire, not a belief. Um, we believe Jesus suffered and died for us because he said he would, and then he did it. Our belief is in this person who suffered and died in our place for us. And it's true. So we believe it. But living this truth is a little harder for us, right? We can't suffer and die for anyone, so we, we can't do that. Um, and plus, I think the Christian faith has become much more about believing correctly than living correctly. We're just more accustomed to or more comfortable with trying to believe or understand and believe the right things and don't pay as much attention to how we live them out. But the truth that Jesus suffered and died for us is the climax of his story, right? And therefore, it is the climax of our story. And there's something vital here for us to live that I think is often missed. And it's vital. I, I want us to read a few verses together um, to hear the testimony of Scripture. Can we see those? The next one. This is John 15. Let's read this together. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. The next one. From 1 John 3, 16. Let's read it again together. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions 
and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Another from Ephesians chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay, just one more. 1 Peter chapter 2. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now we could go on. Um, that's probably more than enough. But let me ask, what, what do you hear? What's a vital way we are to be living or standing in the truth that Jesus suffered and died for us? What do you hear the testimony of Scripture saying to us? Any thoughts? What is one of the vital ways we are to live this truth that Jesus suffered and died for us. Love extravagantly. Love extravagantly. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Look for need What's that? Look for, need us. Look for needs around us. That's right. So we can love extravagantly. What else? Yeah, seek to serve without avoiding suffering. We're to sacrifice our life like Christ sacrificed his. Now, now this is hard stuff, and I think there's a really good reason why we kind of miss this. Because it means we're called to die like Jesus. That Christ's disciples lived to sacrifice themselves for others like he did. When Jesus said, love others the way I loved you, what's he talking about? It's very clear, right? Love others by laying your life down for them in the same way that I loved you by laying my life down for you. And I think, at least if you're like me, I can make love something else. Something that's more comfortable for me something that's more doable for me. That, oh, I can love you the way Christ, he really loves me, he has warm fuzzies for me, and so I'm going to have warm fuzzies for you. But when we look at the context of his suffering, when we see this, this story so clearly in the center of his, of his story and ours, we begin to see the context for what all of these verses are talking about. That Christ's disciples lived to sacrifice themselves for others like he did. That since Jesus loved us by entering into our world, humbly sacrificing himself by laying his life down physically, literally, and since we are to love others the way that Jesus loved us, then we are to be laying our lives down for others. And I want us to hear this because it's really hard to hear, and I need to hear this clearly. This isn't just one way to live the Christian life. This is not just for some Christians. This is the Christian life. There is no other. Do you see that? That's what he was saying. You are to live a life of love like I did. You are to live to die like I did. All right, smile. Come on, smile. Awesome, right? Listen to another verse, Luke 9, 23. Jesus said to all who are following, if anyone would come after me, anyone, he or she must deny himself or herself, take up his cross and follow me. See what he's talking about? Again, the context says it all. Um, when I was in campus ministry with the Navigators, one, I had, someone had a great idea that we should serve 
Take a team of students one summer to serve with World Impact in South Central Los Angeles. Um, South Central Los Angeles is one of those places you don't want to get off the freeway there. Trust me on that one. Um, it's just really, really a terrible place. And so I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So take some students, take my family, and we'll live there for six weeks, and we'll minister with World Impact. And what they do is they plant churches and they develop communities of faith in inner city places like this. And so I, I, you know, I said, yeah, that would be great. And um, we're watching this video about their ministry. And Keith Phillips is the man who founded this ministry. And I, re I'll re I remember it so vividly because... It was such a significant experience for me. Um, at the end of the video, after they talked about all the things they do, Keith Phillips is standing there, and behind him are police cars and policemen running all over the place, shots being fired. And he says, come die with us. <laughs> he literally said that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? We're going to do this for the summer. We're going to take my family there. We're going to take students down there. And he's inviting us to come die with him, you know? Oh, my gosh. What did I do? And I can tell you some stories about what that summer was like, but the biggest thing I realized is I wasn't willing to die. I wasn't able to lay my life down for someone else at that point. And it's an ongoing struggle for me, to be honest, that I have to ask myself, could I love someone the way Jesus loved me? And you know, because our comfort-oriented consumer culture is all about self-gratification, getting what we want out of life. And it promotes a lifestyle that I would say is the exact opposite of following Jesus, right? Right? It's the exact opposite of giving up your life for the sake of others. It's using others to get what you want. And it even, it even creeps subtly into our faith because we go to church, why? To be fed, to get something out of it. We um, go to, go to um, have a quiet time to get something good for our day. We go to pod for having friends and fellowship for us. Um, <laughs> there are just so many ways that it all becomes about us because it's the air we breathe. I mean, even the church budget, most all of the church budget, budget is spent on us. Because it's all about us and what we want out of church. I'm talking to, to all of us, to me too. I'm, I don't want to be mad because you have to pay my salary. Because the world tells us to find happiness, we find it in getting and consuming. Jesus says you will only find joy if you will lay your life down for the sake of others. Polar opposites. I've been, in our reading plan, maybe you came across this, um, in John 17, Jesus makes this statement, and I just have not been able to get, get away from it. John 17, 13, he says, I'm coming to you now, speaking to the Father, this is prayer, but I say these things, all these things about his life and what it was for and what he's about to do. I say these things while I'm still in the world so that, the, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Do you hear that? I'm sharing all this so that they won't miss out on the fullness of the joy of God and allow the world to pull them into some other way of life. This is the only way, as crazy as it sounds, to enjoy the fullness of God's joy. And because this is the vital truth about who Jesus is, was it must also be the vital truth about who we are as his people. We bear his name. And I think it's imperative that if we're to have any influence in our world today, we must become those kind of people because they're not listening to what we have to say anymore. They don't care what we believe. 
until we start living differently. And Jesus himself in John 13, you know, said that the way the world will know us is by our niceness. No, he didn't say that. (laughs) Oh, they're so nice. No, he said, they will know, the world will know you're from me by the way you love each other. And what again, what's he talking about? By the way we give our lives for others. Hmm. So what does this look like? Where do we begin? And for me, and, and maybe you can start here, the thing I had to, I've had to keep asking myself this week, where in my life am I, am I actually sacrificing something of myself for someone else? I mean, really sacrificing. And hear me in this, it doesn't just mean kids, because that's for us. Right? I mean, there are kids, so we want to take care of them and, and meet their needs. But for people outside our family, how are our kids going to know that they're not the center of the universe if they don't see their parents laying their lives down for other people? What does that look like in our lives? Where do we begin? I think, let me just mention a couple things. First of all, it's going to require some time and effort for us to walk with people who are suffering. And, and someone brought that out, which I think is so beautiful. Jesus entered into our suffering. And that's the way to love someone, isn't it? To know their suffering. Um, a theologian, Helmut Helicki, said this, Tell me how much you know of the sufferings of your fellow men, and I will tell you how much you have loved them. And all that means is we can't insulate ourselves from the pain of the world around us. We have to walk into it. That's where it begins. And then, of course, we've got to carve out some time, some money, something of ourselves to sacrifice for others in order to love them the way Jesus loves us. I mean, as a church community, shouldn't we all be serving and giving for the sake of others, for, for the sake of each other. And shouldn't we as a church, I mean, and this is, this is pretty awesome, shouldn't we as a church be sacrificing of ourselves for the sake of those out there? That's what this means. That's what our calling is. The pull of our culture is so strong, there's no way that we can do this as individuals, is it? I mean, we've got to do this as a community. We've got to begin taking steps of living self-sacrificial lives for each other and for our community. And so I, I think it might be another week to be a blessing to others, don't you? But we can add to the blessing um, to bless someone in the Christian family and to bless someone outside of it. But let's, let's make the blessing something we have to sacrifice for. It can be a small sacrifice. It can be a big sacrifice. But let's bless two people this week, someone who's in the family of God and sacrifice something for them to bless them, and someone outside the family and sacrifice something to bless them. It's a good place to start. What do you think? You're not smiling. Okay, it's time to wrap it up. (laughs) But it's good news, friends, because this life, this life is where the life of Christ and his joy is found. The only place. Amen? Let's pray for this. Lord, I'm the first to confess to you that I love the way you've loved me so grateful and it's so hard Lord for me to love others like that Lord it's impossible without your Holy Spirit in us but we hear your call so clearly and so we pray Lord that that you will begin with me with us to begin to walk as you walked to live to die like you did and to find ways that we can sacrifice for others even this week in small and big ways. Lord, we love you and we want to follow you. 
Empower us to be that this week, even today. We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said,